I'm Marty Otanias. Welcome to Getting High on Anthropology. We're at Denver Open Media today. We have a special episode with uh, 13 digital stories created by UC Denver students in a course of mine called Cannabis Culture in Maymester 2019. Today we're going to run 13 videos and in between the videos we're going to talk with a couple of students about their experiences making digital cannabis stories. Hope you enjoy the videos. I am a chronic pothead. I get it, the first step to curing addiction is to admit you have one. Before you judge me, let me explain why my pot addiction isn't what you think it is, and maybe you'll finally understand me just a little bit more. I wake up every morning around 7 a.m. to tend to my plants. It can be laborious at times. Generally, it takes me no more than 15 minutes to care for them all. My ritual begins with placing them in direct sun, where most of them grow best, and ending with me watering them every other day. For me, this is a routine that begins and ends with a feeling of satisfaction, calm, and genuine happiness. They are at once something I can take care of, yet they also take care of me. I thrive off of budding plants and their ripe flowers, though I admit sometimes it doesn't always work out. Good thing I'm cultivating just for me. The diversity of the plant profile is insane. Some have rich, dark green leaves that curl at the end, some have thin, long stems while others are short and stocky. Undoubtedly, they're hard to keep. Not only do they need certain light cycles, watering and nutrient regimens, and planting schedules, they're also susceptible to mold and small insects. In general, I'd say I'm a damn good grower. And I'll admit, it costs a lot of money to maintain this lifestyle. Between all my containers, the pots themselves, and my affinity to grow more, this greenery doesn't grow itself. Wait, you thought I was talking about marijuana? Cannabis? No, not me. Both my roommates, however, are chronic self-acclaimed potheads. Previously, that label has been dangerous. Indeed, pot, marijuana, cannabis, Mary Jane, and the devil's lettuce have been stigmatized and segregated from the scientific benefits of plants for far too long. Both of my roommates enjoy the same satisfactions as I do for my plants, the geraniums, the succulents, and the dumb cane, yet are stigmatized for what plant they adore the most. An era of post-prohibition reaffirms that plants are just plants. While I recognize a multitude of plants can be manipulated, the average plant consumer is seeking the surface level benefits, not an underlying malevolence. My plants provide me beauty, responsibility, and more. Cannabis, like any other plant, yields those qualities alongside medicinal benefits. If being a pothead ostracizes you, then so be it. I'd rather live in a world where the plants that help my roommates are as valid and accepted as mine. For our own individual reasons, we all sat out plants as a medium in an effort to stay rooted. Now, we're thriving. When I first moved to Colorado in 2015 for college, I had a feeling of living in the future while shopping at a dispensary. Looking around the store, I couldn't contain the feeling of amazement. Seeing the innumerable glass jars of sativa and indica flowers on the shelves, the fancy packages with eye-catching graphics on the label, and TV screens with cannabis-related advertisements on them, it all felt entirely foreign to me when looking back on my experiences buying weed back home in Tennessee. At home, it was a shot in the dark as to what strain I was smoking, and the bud came in cellophane wrapping from a pack of cigarettes, or maybe a Ziploc bag, if I was lucky. Little did I know, there was a whole new world of concentrates, dab rigs, vaporizer technology, and more for me to begin learning about. Smoking weed used to be something no one talked about where I grew up. But now, when I come home to visit family, and I talk to people about living in Denver, they can't seem to ask me about anything other than marijuana. A couple of summers ago, I remember hanging out at my friend David's house while I was home for the summer. We had just finished smoking a joint when his dad walked in the door. I quickly got nervous, expecting him to be mad about us smoking a joint in the house. 
Instead, he began talking with me about my medical card and how he loves smoking marijuana and has smoked it for years. When David, his dad, and myself finally stopped talking, I couldn't shake the feeling of disbelief that David's dad, an affluent financial manager, was comfortable openly talking with me about using a drug that is still illegal at the state and federal level. It made me think about how traveling outside of Tennessee to Colorado opened my eyes to what the industry is really like. It's conversations like the one I had with David's dad that slowly begin to change the negative stigma associated with marijuana consumption, that of the lazy, drugged up pothead stoner that just floats through life. This negative stigma fades away even more when you can walk into a dispensary to get an eighth of flour and it feels no different than walking into a Walgreens to pick up a prescription. The post-prohibition era is not all good. Evidence suggests that in two and a half years, five companies may control the majority of the industry market share. The potential for this hyper-commercialization of the industry bothers me. While I'm a proponent of free market operations and capitalism, I'm aware of the exploitation of industries that can arise from high levels of commercialization. Cannabis entrepreneurs that operate the big chain store dispensaries tend to focus too much on profits and branding while neglecting aspects of customer service and product quality. It's easy to walk into any Livewell or Native Roots dispensary and find a cheap $80 ounce that'll get you high and not break the bank. But there's no telling what kind of unhealthy chemicals and molds are in the product that's being smoked. In the post-prohibition era, it is my wish for all consumers to experience the same environment that I enjoy here in Colorado. An environment with personal interactions with bud tenders discussing differences between strains of bud and concentrates, and choosing a quality product, one that fits best for what I need, not just something that gets me high. Buying cannabis no longer needs to feel like buying drugs from a trap house, but rather like buying supplements from a health store. Welcome back. You just watched some digital cannabis stories produced by three students in the course Cannabis Culture at CU Denver. I have the um, pleasure to introduce one of the students, Sophie. She was the producer of the video, uh, the digital story called Pothead. Welcome to the show, Sophie. Thank you. So what was it like producing a video about a drug, um, a, a cultural phenomenon of cannabis? Like, how did you enjoy it? And tell me about the writing process, because you have a writing background. Yeah. Um, I thought it was really healing, uh, the best way to put it for me, because I had such a negative influence, and I think a lot of society today or previously had like a similar background with drugs, specifically cannabis and marijuana. Um, for me, I had such a negative influence from my mother, who was also a drug addict previously. I have a very addictive family. So I took my video and writing that as like getting back to the fun. I really wanted to find enjoyment back in something that I still didn't know much about. What I like about your video and the video produced um, by other students is at the end, we get a little bit of your personality with that last shot. So tell us your decision to put that last shot of you in there. What does that mean to you? Yeah, um, my roommates are some of the strongest women I've ever met. They've been through so much adversity like me and I finally feel really comfortable living in a house full of women who medicate heavily using marijuana. Um, and I felt like that moment was just really spontaneous. And that kind of was the peak of here's where I'm at with this drug. <laughs> and here's where I'm at with sharing it with other people finally. Now the technical aspect of making a video is pretty challenging. You, like some others, had some hurdles to overcome. Tell us about one of the challenges and how did you navigate through it? Yeah, uh, Premiere is hard. <laughs> There's a reason why it's so expensive and you need to put a lot of time and effort into knowing that projects are gonna suck if you don't put a lot of work into it. So dealing with some of the transitions and putting video clips next to where your, your next sentence begins, as you talked about in our class. Um, just getting over those hurdles of technology. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I appreciate, number one, you were willing to share some of this stuff about you personally, and then your creativity. And so I hope maybe um, by this time next year, you might make another video. So do you have anything in planned, or would you like to make one? And if so, what kind of video? Yeah, um, I am really interested in teaching abroad. 
Um, so I'm hoping to start a TEFL of some sort, um, and I'm hoping in the next year or so when I'm traveling a little bit more, I can make a montage video just showing, for me, how my teaching has affected other people, but also myself and that growth over time. Because I think progress is really hard to track if you're never, I don't know, actually keeping track of it, I guess. No, that's great. Really exciting stuff. Um, keep in touch. And if you do think the video might be appropriate for my show, if there's any um, link to cannabis, let me know. And if not, I'd just be interested to see what you produce. Yeah. Um, so we're going to move on. We're going to move on and show another set of digital stories created by students in the CU Denver course, um, Cannabis Culture. That's it. It's over. On December 16th, 2010, the DEA made an unannounced visit to my apartment in San Antonio, Texas. The single moment that gets replayed over and over in my head was hearing my neighbor tell me over the phone, you're fucked. He went on to tell me there are police cars, fire trucks, ambulances all lit up and surrounding your apartment. Officers strapped to the nine are ripping your apartment apart with assault weapons drawn. Four people are in handcuffs in the front lawn. There is a search warrant with your name on it, and Rob has already been taken to jail. The rest is really a blur. I don't even remember if I hung up the phone. Being told that, it's, it's, it, it's like a dream while free-falling. Time stops in between heartbeats, pupils dilate, tunnel vision, depth perception, shot. Lightheaded, cold. Your life flashes before your eyes with everything that's ever made you wince, cry, smile. The only thing you can feel is everything you have ever felt, and in that second, nothing else matters. You're weightless. A traffic stop earlier that night resulted in the seizure of 3.5 grams of marijuana after the car was spotted leaving our place. The incident provided sufficient justification for a judge to issue a search warrant. Should have been taken to jail that night. Everyone should have. Rob's story serves the purpose of collateral damage. Officers physically assaulted him before taking him to jail. He was asleep when they came knocking. He was alone in the apartment. He's also Latino. Because Rob was the only person at home at the time the car was spotted leaving our apartment, he was taken to jail for a laundry list of charges and the distribution of marijuana. The police report would not reflect sufficient evidence to indict anyone on additional charges because the drug remnants of paraphernalia, among other things, were scattered throughout the apartment. My two other roommates and myself, all white, were never formally charged with anything. We were never questioned after that night. No felonies, no misdemeanors, no eviction. Rob's story is the result of systematic prejudice from the failed drug war and our factually void drug policies. I witnessed firsthand the packaging of a product of the system. I was told by police officers that they would not be following up with charges for anyone else because they had already had a conviction for the case. The fact that I was not in jail was, quote, a blessing from our judicial system. In talking about equity in the post-prohibition era, you have to have the conversation about how racism fuels the war on drugs as a direct result of cases that are handled just like this one. Or will we, as a privileged society, continue to view what happened that night as a blessing? Nate, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So your, sh your, um, uh, your digital story has a lot in it. Yeah. And it's pretty intense, pretty um, hair raising. So tell us a bit about the incident that you focused on in the video. Um, well, there was the, uh, it's really the door um, was a big focal part of it. And they, uh, you know, you'd zoom in on it and it's really the whole latch is bent. Um, there was a big dent in the door. Um, and then additionally, there was when um, my friend, he was the only one home. They, uh, yeah, they uh, came in and physically assaulted him before he was asleep. Uh, so I, to what extent is how much force is too much force to subdue someone who's asleep? 
and then to come through it really was like getting to see all these images and and relive those moments you know and it's, it's it was crazy and what i liked about your um video nate you you have all this um different sound effects in there so tell us um the reasoning for some of the sound effects and what was the m one most interesting to you that helped you tell the story you wanted to tell uh definitely the little camera click um to to create the um the vibe of like a crime scene you know ch ching and then the the image fades to white um but then a lot of it was in like a dream segment so it just kind of in and out of focus you know not really knowing what's going on you can't really control your thoughts I was really going with that. The transitions uh, um, were a lot of work, and the computer program as a whole was really fun to use. What I also loved is you improvised like <laughs> other students in the class. So tell us what you did with Gary outside and why that scene was important to you. Well, so I, uh, um, my girlfriend would quote me. I woke up that morning and said, I'm going to go get arrested on campus. Uh, and I, had to, I went with the intent of getting uh, like a 15-second shot of me being, being put in handcuffs and then being put in the back of a car. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was, uh, it wouldn't happen. They, I had to get a bunch of papers signed and they were like at minimum two weeks. So I saw the little uh, carabiners hanging from your curtain and I was like, this will work. Um, and shout out to Gary. He uh, um, held the handcuffs and held me right here by my arm. And that was a really, I just felt like a, um, to, to finish out the video, I needed just the last little segment. And I had that thought late at night, like I gotta go get arrested. I thought it worked well because it, uh, it was a dramatization that just naturally clicked with the story. Mm -hmm. For people who don't know, we met uh, four days a week, uh, four hours a day, Monday through Thursday. During the editing process, you were animated. You would make these loud noises because you found there was a point in your story you loved. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like you really enjoyed the process of making the video. What did you like about it? And was there a problem that you found with the program in terms of like you had to overcome it? And how did you overcome it? Um, it was, well, just really like repetition, watching you. Shout out to Art. Um, with him, all things are possible. Um, <laughs> but le uh, watching you guys and like all the shortcuts and being able to um, replicate that after doing like what would take me 10 minutes took you guys literally six seconds. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed seeing your video and I really hope with the skills that you develop, you keep with it because as you know, you and other students, to be able to produce media yourself and control the narrative it could be powerful. Mm -hmm. um, where do you think by this time next year you might be with some of your cannabis, not just lifestyle stuff, but maybe academically? Um, well, I would love to take a psychology degree and a minor in biology and apply it towards cannabis. So um, really with like advocating for policy change, I have to know how that works in order to be able to do what I want to do. So um, whether that's using videos to make, you know, a really powerful message or um, for a class, that conversation we had at the end of the class and like instead of turning in a paper, do a five minute video, you know, and that just the possibilities are endless. And then lastly, seeing it up on the big screen, how did you like seeing it and would you do anything differently? Uh, I, I really liked the way that it came out. I was really happy with it. Um, it no, I, don't I wouldn't do anything differently to it. I was, that was good. Well, Nate, I really enjoyed um, working with you in the class, and I love your video like all the other students' videos. So thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. So we're going to turn now and watch another set of digital cannabis stories produced by CU Denver students in the May Mester course called Cannabis Culture. Legalizing cannabis in Colorado had a significant positive impact on the state's economy, which led to more job creation and beneficial increase in tax revenues for the state. Since Amendment 64 took its effect on January 2014, it accelerated the employment growth in the state by roughly 5%. Over the last few years, legalization contributed over a billion dollars in tax revenue. Personally, I reap the benefits of driving on fixed roads, living in a beautiful, clean neighborhood with a good infrastructure, having high level of safety, and see great job opportunities in my future. As we can see, new cannabis industry brought money into the local economy, mainly through taxes and cannabis-related tourism. It generated a real economic boost for the state, even considering the costs associated with the law enforcement activities. From solely an economical perspective, legalization of cannabis on the federal level would most likely have an overall beneficial effect on the country. But would it benefit Colorado citizens like me? If cannabis heads this legal direction, it's important for Colorado citizens as me to understand the impact it would have on our local economy. The significant drop in the cannabis-related tourism and inevitable decline in the drug prices might sound appealing to the customers, but would very likely place local businesses at the risk of shutting down. 
The benefits the industry has provided Colorado so far will really undermine and shift in consumers' demand out of the state. Federal legalization would slow the Colorado's economic growth down and discourage new firms from entering the market, which would lower my job opportunities. On another hand, decriminalizing cannabis on the federal level would give a way for research sites to emerge. Taking this direction would allow us to better weight on potential gains against the social, health and safety related costs and predict the outcomes before it would enter the open legalized arena. By experimenting with states with creation of legalized laws, we can study the outcomes and find the best formula for regulating cannabis. Asking first what does this experience teaching us would help us to get the bugs out of the system before applying this method to the rest of the country. I would not support decentralized federal government legalization of cannabis, but leave it for the states to decide. Delegating the decision on legalization to the state's authority would help eliminate any unnecessary disagreement by not applying and one-size-fits-all doctrine and promote steady transition into nationwide cannabis market. I've wanted to be a part of the cannabis industry ever since I got my first medical card. I knew I wanted to be a mother for much longer than that. The opportunity finally arose for me to get into the cannabis industry in the summer of 2017. This is the year I found myself to be pregnant with my son, Vincent. The following two years would show me just how many regulations of people I've never met would go into my journey as a bud tender and a mother. The joy of landing my first job in the marijuana industry was tempered with a steady fear. I already knew that I was about three months pregnant. Cannabis is a male-dominated industry, so I knew that I would have to hide my pregnancy for at least the probationary period of 90 days if I wanted to keep my new job. I was painfully aware of Colorado being an at-will state for companies. I didn't put it past anyone to fire a person they knew would be leaving in a short amount of time. During my first healthcare visit, my OBGYN told me about the changes to the state's regulations regarding THC in pregnancy. My OBGYN has the option to run a full drug panel on me at 20 weeks of gestation, and I can't refuse it. If the panel shows signs of THC or any drugs in my system, Child Protective Services will have to be contacted and I could lose my child. It worried me to hear the news. As a new bud tender, I had no idea how much THC I could absorb through my skin just by handling cannabis. I had no idea whether my pregnancy would be a miserable or enjoyable experience. I quit cold turkey after several years of chronic use. There was no way I was going to let my baby be taken from me. As time went on, customers asked me about my favorite strains, coworkers invited me out to consume with them. It was not difficult to dodge these. Meanwhile, I looked forward to the life developing inside me. Certain coworkers of mine soon realized the cause of the eating habits and fatigue that came with the first trimester of my pregnancy. When it came time for me to tell upper management, I had a support network of women behind me. They made sure I was keeping hydrated and eating the right things. I was provided extra time on my breaks after my return from maternity leave so I could pump. After Vincent arrived, new challenges arose. I was free to consume again, but I refrained for another six months while I breastfed my son. There simply wasn't enough evidence showing that cannabis use doesn't affect newborns. A newborn's brain development is so precise and crucial at that age, I wasn't going to risk it. Besides, I had already stopped for nine months. What was six more months going to do? One early morning at work, protesters visited my store and left baby bibs that read, Don't Hurt Our Future, signed Colorado Kids. I've also gone through sting operations conducted by organizations like Mothers Against Marijuana. These protests really are stark reminders of how society continues to stigmatize a cannabis-consuming mother. Eleven years ago, my doctor diagnosed me with daily chronic migraines and headaches. I visited seven different clinics and the doctors in each one gave me prescriptions, treatments, and doses that never worked. 
My diagnosis is other migraine without status migrainosis, not intractable. This means that my migraines are atypical because they don't respond to usual treatments or have any known triggers. I'm really good at hiding how the migraines affect me. Only my closest friends and family can tell when I'm having a bad attack. Anything higher than a 6 out of 10 in pain results in my return to a quiet dark room. I researched alternative treatments for migraines and headaches, including butterbur, an herb, date piercings, and Botox injections. None fit my lifestyle. Then I found cannabis. That's why the United States entering a post-prohibition era where the country federally legalizes cannabis excites me. It means better research about how cannabis interacts with the human body, knowledge about its medical properties, and easier access and less stigmatization for the cannabis users. With easy access to cannabis, researchers will have little to no restrictions to study THC, CBD, and over a hundred other cannabinoids. People with chronic issues such as myself can safely consume cannabis medicine without being stigmatized. When I tried medical cannabis three years ago, the pain level for my migraine reduced from a 9 out of 10 to a 2 out of 10 within 30 minutes. In the past, migraines forced me to curl up and cry from the awful pain in my head. Bright lights, loud noises, and fast movements left me in agony. Nothing helped. Cannabis makes my pain manageable and ignorable. I can leave the bed without feeling dizzy, nauseous, and with minimal pain. I have better days and I can actually enjoy being out hiking in the mountains. This wasn't always the case. The sun's brightness combined with an extended period of time outside can be a trigger for my migraines. But with medical cannabis, the pain goes away and I can enjoy the outdoors. After 11 years of trying prescription after prescription after prescription, cannabis has become my go-to medicine and allows me to live my life and for that I am grateful. Introduction to cannabis was at the age of 15. My first use was solely experimental. I was curious on why my teachers asked why I was so temperamental. The unaddressed anger grew to be monumental. I was told that it would calm me down, relax my gentle mental. I felt calm without my mind racing and overthinking. I loved this feeling because I was escaping my own mental prison. I experienced the essence of being fully receptive and just being reactive. Under the influence, I realized what was making me so hyperactive. The preservation of my father's relationship was always a concern to his firstborn son that he deserved. Preserving the relationship was the goal, but instead we just diverged even more. Always stating that he was going to leave one day. After so many times, I was just numb to the pain. My use of cannabis was to heal my emotional pain. I saw a life with no father from the viewpoint of my friends whose fathers were convicted with the possession of marijuana. The war on drugs caused so many relationships to end. Now I scroll through my news feed. I read that the federal government finally legalized weed. I didn't know what to believe. It seemed unachievable, just knowing that the state of Louisiana was giving out mandatory life sentences to those racial minorities selling weed. This occurred during a time in my life where I'm witnessing the prejudice and discrimination of violent acts African Americans are being exposed to. On the other hand, states who legalized weed like Colorado saw economic boost from the above ground cannabis market and I'm seeing old white men profit. Witnessing the hypocrisy, I'm telling you right now, release all my people and pardon the petty convictions that spent the majority of their time in the system. Eradicate the policy that was responsible for the absence of the male figures in minority communities, leaving mothers to raise sons, resulting in children questioning where the whereabouts of their father. This federal legalization was a progressive step forward, but what we lost was sad to see. So many casualties due to the former war on drugs. The warfare defeated the purpose. Instead of preventing drugs from entering our communities, drugs flooded our streets and drugs were done on the Wall Street. There was no ethical issue, just people who strongly held on to their convictions. This cannabis industry is in dire need for some color, like our dying coral reefs. Not just CEOs, I'm talking about head farmers, cultivators, and every other job that's within the industry. Pay reparations to those families who were stifled or divided by the system. Give them the tools to contribute to the cannabis science and society. Because science is organized knowledge, wisdom is organized life experiences. Those who demonize cannabis lack the knowledge due to their inexperience. Don't disregard the benefits for those who find sensation of its glory. Just remember, struggle is the common enemy, but weed is the remedy.
Welcome back. You just watched a couple of digital cannabis stories produced by students in the CU Denver course, Cannabis Culture. One of those students, one of the producers of a video, is here with me, we, is here with me now. Carlos, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So a few minutes ago, we, we got to watch your video. Mm -hmm. Did you like seeing it up there? What did you like about it? Oh, I, I loved seeing it up there. It was, uh, it was just, I chalked it up as a win because it was my first time putting my words actually into video. And it, I, it was very successful. I felt really happy with you and Art's help, especially everybody else's for the feedback. But yeah, I enjoyed it. And what I really liked the most was just me, ch me trying to put that unspoken emotion into you know actual actual like you know sound like it was just it's in my head but to express it how i wanted it to be expressed was a little difficult so the process starts with a story prompt mm -hmm. and then you're given um a 400 word length to write a story so you chose not a traditional story you chose a different format so tell us about the format and why is it important to you um uh, the format was basically spoken word and i really enjoyed the fact that I was able to have this much freedom with this prompt, and I really enjoyed that. And I, that's when I really embraced it, and um, I wanted to be exposed. I think that's one thing we always lack, and we kind of cap ourselves with creativity when we don't want to be that exposed. And I want to expose myself emotionally, um, <laughs> emotionally and psychologically, I guess. And uh, it was it was it was fulfilling. I needed that exposure in this project it's that prompt was all I needed was to get to get that feeling and let me just remind viewers what the prompt was so the prompt was imagine it's the post prohibition era today and is that something that you're happy about or is it something that frustrates you and people were given this prompt and it was just a guide but the key point was to get a 400 word script written um, what I like about your script um, it's like a journey you took us to these different moments in your life that were pretty pivotal and quite intense emotionally so one of those moments was your relationship with your dad so tell us about how you wove some of those experiences into your story? Um, first, I had to really convince myself that I wanted to talk about my father. <laughs> it was actually one of my first pieces I revealed to anybody about my feelings towards my father. Very authoritative, very um, disciplined. You know, he thought fathering is I'm gonna give you a house to live in and food and water to drink out of. And he succeeded and I'm not, I don't down him one bit, but where I missed was just the how stern he was and it was, difficult is like every time I got in trouble you know he paid attention so I actually you know followed the trend and uh, I actually that wasn't the reason why I started cannabis though but obviously throughout the story I wanted to I didn't feel like myself I started being started demonizing myself because others saw me in a particular way why they didn't understand that I lacked emotional intelligence and I didn't know how to gain that no one was teaching me that ever so I came off as standoffish aggressive uh, <laughs> not a joy to be around, but you know, it's, I forgot the question. <laughs> no, no, that was great. I really appreciate you sharing thoughts about your dad, integrating some of your experiences with your father in the script. And of course with you, you know, you come in to clash, you got your headphones on. Music is something that you, you really like and it's fundamental to your project. So what role does music play for you? Not just in your, your video, but in spoken word, the formula itself. I feel like it just gives it like an extra boost, like that extra, it lets it mm, to it, you know, it's just music's everything. Music's life, music's my therapy, you know, music's the shoulder I cry on sometimes, but it complemented my piece and I needed to find a piece that set the tone that I wanted. It wasn't too, wasn't too aggressive, wasn't too, you know, uh, upfrontish. I wanted something calm, cool, or collective. So the last question is in the class, there's 13 students. You, before the class ended, you subscribe now to Premiere Editing, the editing software. So you're pretty serious about it. So I'm, why did you subscribe and what direction do you want to go? Uh, I subscribed to it because I was, I was just like baffled at how many things you could do. Uh, I saw you and Art, you know, going, just going in on it. And um, I, wanted, I wanted this piece of that because I plan on doing a podcast myself and actually producing it myself. So I was like, this is like a great program, but I need to learn it. So. I need to expose myself to it on a daily, and I have been so far. Excellent. Well, Carlos, I appreciate your creativity, your commitment, and your willingness to be vulnerable. Um, I think the piece turned out really well. A little complicated. We had two <laughs> cameras. We had some uh, problems with audio syncing we had to work through. But, uh, yeah, thanks for taking the time and being on the show. Thanks for having me, Marty. I appreciate it. So we're going to move on and show another set of digital stories created by students in the CU Denver course, Cannabis Culture. Enjoy the videos.
Today, if decriminalization of cannabis happened in the U.S., many people around the country would benefit from the ability to openly consume cannabis. My own experiences have shown me that alcohol is much worse than cannabis. Alcohol consumption was largely behind a number of near-death experiences. I have two titanium plates in my face after a friend stopped me from making a horrible decision by forcefully restraining me. During the fight that ensued, I sustained injuries which required surgical intervention. Alcohol is much more powerful and debilitating than any form of marijuana could ever be. The addiction rates from alcohol and the number of lives it's devastated is obvious from a simple Google search. The Denver Post wrote in 2016, about two years after recreational use became legal in Colorado, the article highlighted that adult Coloradans aged 18 to 25 report binge drinking on a numerous occasions in a single month. Colorado comes in above average in binge drinking with nearly 47.5% of 18 to 25 year olds, while the national average sits around 43%. In my own family, I've seen several people struggle with the addictions of alcoholism, and I've seen the long-term impacts of heavy drinking. Despite this, family members and I do not talk about the harmful effects of drinking or demonize it in the way we do cannabis. For a long time, Family members who consume on a regular basis refer to marijuana as medicine. I'm able to recall any conversations where alcohol was discussed in the same manner. This may likely be the same for you and your family. I felt the benefits of cannabis consumption, but at risk of losing federal benefits from my military service. The fact that this is even a possibility goes to show the importance of reform for the laws that govern marijuana and its uses. I'm excited to see what the future has in store for marijuana because I feel we are just scraping the surface of the uses of this crop. After I left the military, I obtained a job with a company that provided physical security for a number of grow operations and dispensaries in Colorado. Through this experience, I've seen a side of the industry that is hidden from ordinary consumers. Some owners are laser focused on putting product on store shelves at the expense of safe work conditions while other owners sell cannabis that is tainted with mold, pesticides, and non-weed related material. One time I was on a night shift at a grow facility. The company's security systems were hacked and digital files were deleted. The culprit tried to attempt a physical intrusion but failed. After the incident, I required the guards under my supervision to carry AR-15 style rifles similar to what criminals from other break-ins have been observed using. You might be thinking, why does a security specialist need this type of capability at a domestic grow facility? It's important that security personnel have similar capabilities as people that try to gain access to guarded facilities. Plus, the safety of my guys is paramount over anything else. Members of my crew share similar military backgrounds as me and receive ample close quarters firearm and non-lethal training through our company. They're effectively prepared to use good judgment to protect themselves and the client's site when any threat arises. It's clear that security companies and other ancillary businesses influence the legal cannabis sector. The lessons learned is that employees and customers should be treated fairly and not put in harm's way by cannabis corporations driven by making as much money as possible. Welcome back. You just watched a couple uh, digital cannabis stories produced by CU Denver students in the course Cannabis Culture. One of the students, a producer of one of the digital stories, is here with me today, Gary. Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I really appreciate the creativity, the work you did. How did you like seeing your video up on the screen? Uh, it was interesting, definitely. It was kind of a journey for me to get to where that video is at today. I mean, I shared some stuff with the class that I've never shared with anyone before, so it was rewarding. Cool. And then the, the video, you have all this stuff in there, video clips from, from I guess, your work, you have grow mm -hmm. houses. So what one photograph or video clip is your favorite and why? Mm -hmm. uh, probably just the opening image of me and my dog up on that mountain, just because it's just an image that I love and it uh, speaks to me a little bit, I guess. What I love about these pieces is that they are so personable and when you have a picture of you and your dog, we definitely learn something about you and obviously one thing you like to do to get away and that you have this companion. Mm -hmm. The other thing I really enjoyed about having you in the class, you're what I call a low maintenance student. <laughs> you, you were on your own, 
pretty much just doing your thing, and then periodically you'd say, I'm ready. And so it was a pleasure to work with you <laughs> along you. those lines. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, also, I want to really ask you about being a security guard in mm -hmm. the cannabis sector. Um, it seems like a pretty sketchy job in terms of like your own health being at risk. So is it, like, are there, were there occasions where you felt not safe, or do you have the training to deal with this kind of stuff? Uh, personally, I, I mean, I have a pretty cool head most of the time. But I have been in some situations where, yeah, I did feel like, okay, something might happen. I need to be a little bit more cautious with things. And then your position allowed you, as we saw in your video, to sort of get a perspective that normally people don't see. Definitely. And so it seems like you did witness certain things that you thought were questionable practices. Yeah. You want to tell me a little more about one of those? Yeah. I mean, I used to work, you know, 40 hours a week overnight in a grow house, spinning 15 hours per shift in that grow house. And I did start to develop like some health issues from it. So, I mean, that just goes, speaks volumes because I was perfectly healthy before and now afterwards. And do you think the health conditions may have been from either dust or something related to the plant? Yeah, definitely. The grow house I was working in was not the cleanest place at all. And it, the upkeep definitely just wasn't there. So. Excellent. Well, definitely before you go, it'd probably be appropriate that at least, at least for me, because I don't know, what is the name of your dog? Oh, uh, Bailey. <laughs> Bailey. <Yeah. laughs> and then what do you and Bailey have planned now for the summer now that the course is over? Uh, exploring. Yeah, go explore this beautiful state that we all live in. Excellent. Well, I hope, Gary, you continue to do some video stuff. And I think this might be the second class I've had with you. So I hope maybe to see you again. And if you graduate soon, you know, the best of luck. Oh, thank you, Marty. It's been a pleasure. We're going to watch a couple more videos produced by students in the course Cannabis Culture. Hope you enjoy the remaining digital cannabis stories. The phone vibrates on my nightstand. Swiping a finger across the screen brings a slight smile to my face as the message opens. A few quick gestures with my thumbs and the boring afternoon I was envisioning transforms into meeting up with my friends for a smoke sesh at the park. The park is our spot, not just for me and one certain friend, but for all of us, our whole little crew and then some. That's where we can have fun, let loose, be ourselves and be free. Dance like no one's watching even when there are over 20 people around us because they're all like family. And yeah, we have different views, occupations, religions, whatever, but we all smoke cannabis. And although that's a common ground we could find almost anywhere, the park is our safe haven. I was raised in Texas, which sometimes feels like being raised in another country. No, my family and I don't have oil wells in our backyard. We don't ride horses to school, wear cowboy hats, or drive a pickup truck. Being from the Bible Belt means ultra-conservative ideals and an above-average rate of church attendance. High school and college football are a second religion. 62% of American adults are in favor of legalizing cannabis. Based on my experiences, I doubt many of these supporters live in Texas. The Compassionate Use Act only allows the sale of CBD oil for epilepsy patients. The act is restrictive and only 21 doctors are registered to prescribe CBD. Three dispensaries exist in Texas compared to 463 medical dispensaries and 564 retail stores in Colorado. General prohibition of cannabis in Texas did not stop me or virtually all of the people I know from consuming cannabis products. My first time is one of my fondest memories. The ritual involved a homemade honey jar water pipe that a guy brought to a party. Five guys and I smoked in an alley for maybe half an hour and during that time the group of guys became some of my favorite people. That was almost a decade ago. Today, although we've all gone our own routes, we still stay in touch and in our own ways are contributing to a new cannabis culture. Dear Opie, you were there when I needed you. But you took an independence from me that led me to achieve my goals. Ultimately, I obsessed over you so much that you were paramount over all the hard work I achieved to attain my career. The more you helped me, the more I needed you. My cravings were insatiable, and it was hard coping with the pain of my career-ending injuries. The depression that followed detached me from my team, my squad, my platoon, and my family. You helped 
helped me cope with these pains, but created a gateway to harder derivatives. In the 60s, you swooned my uncle the same way you won me over. Like me, he was a combat infantryman. During my uncle's volunteer service to the U.S. Marines, he developed an addiction to opium during his tour in Vietnam. Being a third generation medalist to serve in a time of war, I was proud until the effects of fighting in combat zones set in. It was hard trying not to relive my uncle's mistakes. Don't get me wrong, I miss the good times we shared with alcohol. Nothing that good lasts forever though. Ultimately the dependence on you deepened and I was hospitalized. I thought I needed you to survive. Doctors at my bedside stared in shock as I yelled at them to amputate my leg. The pain of relying on you was overwhelming. While exiting the military, I bumped into an old flame of mine, Mary Jane. I was scared to see her, but her familiar embrace brought me a relief without any dependency. She provides unconditional love, something not available from you. The military needs to consider her for pain management because there is no risk for overdose with servicemen and women. When I was excessively reliant on you, I attempted to take my life. I cried aloud as I pressed the barrel against my head. My dear Opium, you are a wonderful weapon of mass destruction. You do not have a stranglehold over my behavior. Goodbye. You just watched um, Art Morales. Um, he produced a digital story in the course um, Cannabis Culture at CU Denver. Art is with me today. Welcome to the show, Art. Thank you for having me. Uh, pretty grateful to you and others for the, um, the effort you put into the project. Pretty intense stuff. Uh, so kudos to you for being willing to share that and of course other students being willing to open up. So tell us about your project um, from start to finish because you know, you're a filmmaker and so to get deep into your own personal story can be pretty challenging. So tell us a little bit about the process and then why did you feel at this time comfortable to share that story? Well, there, there's uh, three uh, stages of um, storytelling when it comes to cinema. You're, you write it out, you get the footage for it, and then you also uh, make adjustments in the edit. So it's being written three times. And writing it out, it, it is uh, cathartic, um, able to express uh, stuff that is usually just held in uh, to the world. But having to go <laughs> and look up uh, pictures of the past and started thinking about the past and it's um, it, it's a little hard but it's rewarding when you know that your work is helping uh, tell the stories of servicemen and women that um, are afraid of uh, smoking marijuana and it's yeah, it's it's. I, I know people in my old uh, company that were honorably or dishonorably discharged for that reason, just uh, medicating, and it's really unfortunate because of uh, what they what what they were uh, doing uh, in Afghanistan uh, on some uh, some of the days. Like they had a a casualty and an exfil, and it was it was a hard day for that platoon and I can't imagine having to have that fear of medicating in that uh, military culture. So, yeah. Um, the thing about your video, which was so intense, is that it does have a message, which you just touched on, that you would like to see some kind of change, some transformation. Explain it one more time why this change is needed for you uh, and what could we do to facilitate that change? Well, I think the change should be legalization on a federal level. 
mainly because the VA as well as the Army would be able to medicate uh, using a natural herb that isn't, um, what is it, that doesn't cause adverse effects the way opium does. And uh, it's, it's not um, going to cause any overdose uh, on the scale that's uh, happening right now because there's about 70,000 Americans per year uh, that die from overdose of opium and it's more than um, car collisions. Incredible. Yeah. And you also, professionally, you, you're on your way or you already are a filmmaker, so tell us about your current project and how can people learn more about it? Uh, right now I'm producing a film uh, about the industrialization of hemp. Uh, I'm going to be taking a course uh, with you uh, that is starting on Monday. Uh, that's gonna it's gonna provide an international perspective uh, gaining the uh, uh, knowledge of the Dutch and bringing it uh, to America but right after um, that trip I'm coming back to cover a, uh, a sentencing uh, with two individuals uh, one from Colorado the other from uh, Oregon and they were transporting uh, hemp you know 915 plants so with th that type of uh, charge that they're conflating with uh, cannabis it is a mandatory minimum of five years. So this is uh, the local perspective that I'm finding because this is the farmer's worst fear. Um, this is an essential uh, uh, event in the story that I'm going to capture and I'm excited to uh, capture right, so Art, right, I want to thank you not just for being willing to share your story, but you are also sort of the, the class assistant, the <laughs> lab uh, assistant. So I really want to uh, express my gratitude. And again, your story, all the other 12 students, great pieces. I'm looking forward to our trip uh, together in Holland, and I'm going to be looking out for some of the stuff you're going to produce. So thanks again for being on the show. Thanks again for having me. We're going to end here. Thank you for tuning in. You watched 13 digital cannabis stories produced by CU Denver students in the course Cannabis Culture. Thank you and have a good night. Yes, I'm here to get my MED work badge so I can work in the industry. Okay, do you have a completed application? Yes, I do. Okay. It's right here. Take your application and your Colorado driver's license or ID. Yeah, I got one of them. Okay. Okay. Oh, and it looks like that you did it double side. You need it single side only. So if you could reprint that and come back with it single-sided, I'll highlight the areas that you do need to complete on your application, but if you could bring that back in. Can I help you? Yes, uh, I was here earlier and uh, I filled out all my forms on single shape uh, paper and I have my Great. paperwork. I think I'm ready to go. Can I get your driver's license again? Please? Of course. And how are you gonna pay today? Uh, cash okay? Yes. Is your driver's license back? Thank you. Okay, now I need from you is to go straight down this hall to the restroom, wash your hands, have a seat behind this blue wall, and they'll call you when they're ready to fingerprint and take your picture. Right down the hall here? Right down is the there hall. Like the a bathroom, bathroom or something? To the restroom. Yes. All right, all right, thank you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Have a nice day. All right, I'm ready. Okay, so just go ahead and have a seat behind this blue wall, and they'll call you when they're ready. To right here? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you.
All right, Jeff, I'm gonna spray your hands down with some water to help raise the prints. Just gonna spray that down. Go ahead and rub your hands together for me. Great, thank you. Come on over here and have a seat because we're gonna get your picture for your badge. All right. All right. Just Fantastic. <laughs> now, I see your name is Jeffrey. Do you go by Jeffrey or Jeffrey's Jeff? fine. Or Jeff, because you can put Jeff if you want. No, Jeffrey. Jeffrey? All right, let's get you going here. Okay, now your badge will expire two years from today. Prior um, to your expiration date, about 30 days in advance, you could renew it. Okay. Uh, you, you have two choices. You can either go online, you print out the application. It's a three or four page application. You can either mail it in, you fill it out, you um, attach a check, or ca a check or money order, and a copy of your picture ID, and then you just mail it in here, and then we will get you your new badge, okay? We'll mail it out to you. Okay. Um, or if you want to do it like the same day, you can bring all your paperwork in and you can come in and renew at the counter. You don't have to wait in line. You just sign in there and we'll call you right away and we can you can walk away with your badge at that time. Okay, Jeff, we're gonna get your picture taken, okay? All right. So look at this little eyeball right here. Oh, a selfie. Yeah, it's like a selfie. And I'm gonna go three, two, one, count backwards. And when I say one, it's gonna take a picture. So smile or not smile, it's up to you. <laughs> okay, ready? Okay, three, two, one, hold that pose. All right, Jeff, we've got four pictures here, so you can choose which one you like. They all kind of look the same, but it's oh, up to you. Oh, that one looks fine. The first one here? Sure. Okay, we're gonna click on this one. Okay. All right, it's my okay. badge. No, no, not yet, not yet. Wait, I just uh, wanted you to look at your picture. Okay, so there's your picture, you're good. I'm gonna put a little hole in it for you. So like that, so now you got a hole. Now, I'm also going to give you one of these nice lanyards that you're going to eventually put it on. But what I need to do is I need to um, put it in your file because your prints and stuff have to come back from uh, CBI and FBI to make sure you're clean. So I don't get this today? I don't get this today? No. Sorry. Bummer. <laughs> All right. Well, go ahead and meet me at the table over there and we'll get you checked out. Here's this batch. Okay. He's all ready to rock. <laughs> okay. So I need you to self address your envelope where you want your badge to be sent to. Okay. Okay. Okay, if you could sign the top copy, the bottom copy is yours. This is your M number. You could start applying for jobs, but you cannot start working until you have badge in hand. This is your M number here. Right here? This is the number that will be on your badge. You could start applying for jobs. You just can't start working until you have badge in hand. Okay, okay. but I can tell them I have a it's, badge it's number? That it's pending, and you will receive it seven to 10 days once we get your fingerprint results back from CBI and FBI. Okay. Okay. Do I get one of those? That's your receipt. Okay. Okay, thank you. You are done. Have a nice day. Thank you. Seven to ten days. Seven to ten days. Seven to ten days. Seven to ten days. Yes. Seven to ten days. Thank you.